a game that you have probably never heard of, which I have to say is such a shame, but we are here to rectify that today, so don't you worry. Welcome and welcome back everybody, Tia here, and in today's video I'm going to be sharing with you my top 10 favorite solo flexible games. What does that mean exactly? Well, as you may know, there's an ever increasing market for designers and publishers to include both multiplayer and solo versions of games. However, they don't always necessarily capture the same enjoyment or maintain the integrity of the original design. So for this list, I chose 10 of my favorite games that have equally as good multiplayer versions and solo play. So whether you are primarily a solo player or like to play with friends, or if you're flexible and like both, like me, there are going to be some really great games for you to check out on this list. Now I haven't played every board game known to man, working on it. So if you have any suggestions, please feel free to leave them down in the comments for myself and others to check out. You guys always have great recommendations, so I can't wait to see those. Hey everybody, Tia from the future here with two really quick asides. Number one, for the purposes of this top 10 list, I did not include any fan-made solo variants of games, though there are many that are quite good. In order to narrow it down to just 10 games, I only included games that have official solo play that are supported by the designer and publisher. And number two, there would be a lot of overlap on this list with my top 10 solo games of all time video, so I did not include those games on here. I'll put a link up in the card and down in the description if you want to check out that video after this one. And for those of you who have seen that video and are curious to know which of those games have excellent multiplayer versions, I will bury those way, way, way down in the description so there are no spoilers for anyone else who hasn't seen it yet. But without further ado, let's get started with my number 10. For my number 10, I chose a drafting game that with the expansion supports up to seven players and includes a very exciting solo mode, and that is Paper Tales, published by Stronghold Games and designed by Masato Uesugi. Over the four rounds of this game, you'll be drafting five cards per round that will help you generate resources to build various buildings and also give you battle points in which you'll be able to defend your city and attack players on either side of you. This game does follow some of the standard kinds of interactions with drafting that have been found in classic games such as Seven Wonders, but in this game I find it to be quite a bit more succinct because you can only have up to four units in your tableau from round to round, including any that you've had from previous rounds. And though there are going to be seven unique buildings to choose from to build in every game, you can only construct one of them per round, which means you could have a maximum of four buildings. So this game does go by very quickly, it's very straight to the point, which I personally personally enjoy. Now as far as the solo play goes, you will be drafting cards versus your opponent, the Lich King. And this was one of the first games that I tried to play that has a strong drafting component but has a solo mode. And in my brain, I just could not conceive of how that would work out. So essentially, you're going to draw five cards, keep one, draw four cards, keep one, draw three cards, keep one. Now with the discarded cards, you will shuffle them up, draw two, keep one, and then finally take a random one off the top. So essentially, you are drafting your cards much in the same way that you would with other players where you're going to see some of those cards you drafted earlier come back to you but the remainder of your cards will go to the Lich King. And to make things even more exciting, the Lich King during each of the four different rounds will have a different scoring condition. So in one round, he may really want to gather cards that have meat icons on them. And for each of those that you discard into the Lich King's pile, he will score a number of points. So it incentivizes you, like in a multiplayer drafting game, to not necessarily just take the cards that are best for you, but to also also be aware of what's going on with the players around you and make sure that you're not giving them the cards that will score them the most points. This one, like I said, is fantastic. It plays in just four rounds. It's super quick and to the point. I love the aesthetic provided by Christine Alcouf, and I just think it's an excellent example of how you can take drafting for seven players all the way down to one player and still maintain that really exciting drafting from turn to turn. Now, for some people, four rounds for this game might feel a little short. So in that case, I would suggest looking into another 
multiplayer drafting game, which is It's a Wonderful World. Now, this is one of my favorite multiplayer drafting games. However, the solo mode is a little bit lacking compared to Paper Tales, where you're not necessarily giving cards to an opponent per se, mostly just cycling through the cards you need, and you have some buildings that you specifically have to build by the end of the game. So this is one that may be more to your taste. You might not mind the difference in drafting for solo play, and you may prefer to have a bigger engine that you can build over the course of multiple rounds, but for me, I personally really enjoy the flavor, the game length, and both the multi and solo play for Paper Tales. My number nine pick is one of the games that I always have the most fun playing multiplayer. So when CGE announced that they were releasing an official solo mode for it, free and available on their website, I could not resist, and that is Adrenaline. This is essentially a first person shooter battle royale style game where you're going through different rooms, spawning in, picking up items, weapons, ammo, and trying to kill your opponents before they kill you or each other. One of the things that's really interesting about this game is that the timing is really exciting. So it's not based on who does the most damage, it's all based around who gets that final kill shot, and if you can do overkill, then you get to mark your opponents which gives them more incentive to come back and kill you. There's just so many exciting features of this game that really capture the essence of a first-person shooter video game, which I, at the time when this came out, didn't really think was possible. Now, the solo play is really exciting because you are essentially playing against three automated players, and each round you'll be using some of the different cards that give you items and ammo in order to program what the other three players will be doing. So it's really interesting because you can see a little bit into the future and you can anticipate what each of the three AI characters will be doing. Now, there is a way for you to be able to kind of stop them in their tracks. Essentially, if you damage the spawn point that corresponds to their color, you'll flip their program card upside down, and instead of them doing damage to you, they are going to short circuit and damage themselves. You always have to decide over whether to shoot the characters outright or to maybe shoot the spawn point and stall them for a round, or there are some weapons that if you can get them in the same area, you can damage the entire room. So this one is a really great and fun action-packed game, and my favorite part is once you get down to the nitty-gritty, once there have been enough kills, players flip over their boards to the adrenaline side, which gives them these amped up actions that make it an exciting game from start to finish. So if you are a fan of those styles of video games and are getting into board gaming, this is a really cool one to check out and all of the characters have such interesting flavor and personalities that is really shown through in the rulebook and in their different abilities. So I would definitely check out Adrenaline, published by CGE Games and designed by Philip Neduk. Coming in at number eight, we have a stark contrast to our previous game. In this game, you are not going to be shooting other players. In fact, there's no violence whatsoever. And that is Petrichor, designed by David Turkop, published by Mighty Boards and Eight Games. In this game, you are essentially influencing the weather, placing your rain droplets into clouds, which will then hydrate different types of plants and flowers around the board. Essentially, this is an area control game. The theme and the way that it plays out makes it feel so different from any other traditional area control games that I've personally played. It's not necessarily a genre of game or a mechanic that I enjoy, but in this game it just works so well. One of the things that I love is that all of the different tiles will score differently. So coffee, for example, first needs to have water droplets on it and then needs to survive through a summer weather pattern in order for it to grow and be able to provide points for those that are on that tile. In addition to that, players will be voting on a weather track. Each different season, two of those will activate and allow players to do different things or help to score different types of plants. And finally, instead of placing on the weather track, you can also manipulate the harvest dice. So these dictate when a harvest will happen, AKA a scoring round. 
So over the course of four to six rounds, depending on your, if you're playing a short or long game, you may not score at the end of each round. The players have a lot more control over when all of that happens, which make it really exciting for an area control game because there's not just necessarily one path to victory. You could literally have a majority on every single tile and it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to score the most points based on the specific tiles, whether there's a harvest season and what weather conditions trigger at the end of a round. Now the solo mode was designed by David Turksey and it really maintains the integrity of that multiplayer game. In this version, you do have an AI deck that will put out droplets or retract droplets. And in addition to that, it'll be able to place points onto the scoring board or manipulate the harvest dice. But these are all a little bit more pre-planned and programmed, whereas in the multiplayer, you have to try to anticipate what other players will do, which can sometimes be a little stressful. In this game, it's going to be a lot more clear cut as to what things will resolve and who will be able to score what, where exactly the droplets will move to based on the different charts and the different types of plants that are out. So I just think that this is a really elegant solo mode that takes area control to a very puzzly um, and relaxing place. So that is my number eight, Petrichor. Number seven on this list is going to be my smallest game. In fact, the base game for two is only 18 cards and the solo play variant only adds six cards to that. And that is John Bluetooth's Antimony, published by Button Shy Games. In this game, you are going to be manipulating time and space, moving forward and backward through time on this continuum in order to collect cards, forming a paradox. And this is going to be based on the color and shape or numbers on the cards. Now, now, that may seem very straightforward, but if you have played any games in this realm that deal with cards that have different combinations, you may find that it can actually be pretty tricky. And with this game, there's also going to be a codex which shows a color of card or a type of element that you will not be able to use from round to round. This is a really interesting two-player game. It's very quick, but there are a lot of puzzly decisions easy to learn, hard to master. And the solo play, I would say, follows that same kind of suit. In this particular instance, you will be doing the same kinds of things, trying to collect groups of three cards to form paradoxes, but you will be doing so on a timer. As you go through the space-time continuum that you are traveling back and forth along will be kind of depleting and deteriorating. Cards will be replaced, so instead of having a color, a shape, and a number, they may become colorless, so you can only use them for their shape or their number. Um, some of the cards will provide many numbers but not have a color or usable shape provided on them. So it's really about scoring as many paradoxes as you can before that time runs out. This is just such a juicy little package, and it was one that I really enjoyed at two. So when they button shy announced that they would be releasing an official solo play for it that added just six little cards, I just thought it was really exciting. And again, sometimes these small expansions, the solo play as an add-on after the fact, don't always land. But in this one, it's one that really excites me, and it's one of my top games from their line to play solo. For number six, we are returning to a theme that is very near and dear to me. And though some people might say it's overdone, for me, there is no such thing when it comes to this theme. The game is role player. And in role player, you are essentially creating a character sheet with different stats by rolling dice, which have different colors and values. It's really puzzly in terms of trying to get the right color die lined up and to get the correct number of pips per row for your strength, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, all of that great stuff. Now the expansions add a lot more to it and I am a huge fan. Monsters and Minions adds a final boss that you can fight as as well as minions that you can battle with throughout your time collecting weapons and improving your character. The Fiends and Familiars expansion adds a familiar, like a little animal buddy that you can take around with you. You don't necessarily even have to be a druid class to have one. And Fiends, which are pesky little critters that may plague you for taking some of the better options when drafting dice. 
The solo play essentially really affects the drafting part of this game. So if you take the best available dice to you, then the solo AI will remove more market cards or minions that you would normally be able to purchase and or score. So it's really fine balance between risking it. If there's a card you really want, it might not be best to take the best dice because it may get removed. Or if you take a lower value, you'll know you'll have first pick in the market. This game is so excitingly puzzly and I love the addition of the fact that you're not only building your character, but with the expansions, you also get to go out and fight actual minions and a final boss. I just think it's a really exciting use of dice, both for combat roles and in a non-traditional way for using the pips to add up to the different stats that you're going to be attributing to your character over the game. So this is a really exciting package. The base game is quite good, but I definitely will always be playing it with the expansions just for that adventure element um, that really adds to the overall theme of the game. This one does have a little bit of setup, so I thought I would mention that if this seems a lot for you or it's not necessarily your theme, another game that is very similar with drafting dice to get certain colors and pips is Sagrada. This one also has exciting solo play. Essentially, the dice that you don't take will go to the solo board, which will then dictate the total amount of points that you need in order to win the game. So this one has a far quicker setup, has a totally different theme and aesthetic, and is very good. But for me personally, I really love the chunkiness of role player and how you can manipulate the dice throughout the game. Both are excellent multiplayer and solo games though, and definitely worthy contenders for the number six spot on this top 10 list. Coming in at number five, we have a face that may look familiar if you've been here on the channel before, and that is Osprey Games Village Green, designed by Pierre Sylvester. I did do a full board game party with a playthrough, tutorial, and review on my channel. I'll put a link up in the card if you want a full look at this game. This is a tile lane game where you are taking cards and placing them into your garden. Up to nine of those cards will be different types of elements in your garden, whether they are flowers, gazebos, statues, ponds, and the other six cards that you'll be placing in a border around your grid will be different scoring conditions for that column or row. This is a really puzzly little card game. It comes in a very compact package. It's aesthetically pleasing to look at. And the solo play and multiplayer are essentially the same. Um, in the multiplayer version, you are going to be taking the card. So the interaction that comes from there may be that you take a card that you know your opponent wants. So there's a little bit of drafting from that pool there. But in the solo game, you're going to be doing similar things, but with restrictions. Because you don't have other players that will be potentially taking cards that you want, you are not going to be able to replace your scoring objectives unless you use a special type of card or power. So I thought that that was a really great way to maintain the tension that happens throughout the game, provide some still really interesting choices, but not make it just a clear cut path to win for the solo play. This is a game that has a theme that is very prevalent in the board gaming world, but I bet you've never seen it implemented quite like this. And this is Martin Wallace's Hitsy Road, published by Space Cowboys. In this game, you are playing, going through the zombie apocalypse, collecting different locations for points, punching zombies in the face, and scavenging for resources. Now, one of the things that makes this game so unique is the theme and how it is integrated into the components. So essentially, unlike in other zombie games where you're playing very abstractedly as a character and everything's dark and gritty, the entire game is designed as if it's a little boy that's going on vacation with his family during the zombie apocalypse. If you look at this game, it looks like there's marker on here. And I looked this up, but this is actually a super old game box from way back um, called Hit The Road. And so this boy has essentially just found this and drawn on it with marker, put all these different things in the box in order to make his own board game. Um, another example of that that I absolutely love are the player order markers. So normally, you know, just could have been numbers. It could have just been cards, but instead we have like the number one player marker is a happy croc burger. 
uh, rewards card with some of them stamped in. We have a medical insurance card for number three. The cards that you use throughout the game look like dirtied up old cards from different diners and motels that you would get. The end game cards are actually references to other board games. So like here we have an old Dixit card as one of the scoring conditions. Um, we have the fourth wonder <laughs> and also like a ticket from Ticket to Ride. And the resources are one of my favorite parts. They're essentially just bottle caps from different sodas and things like that with little stickers for what type of resource they stand for. So this one is just so whimsical and exciting. And not only that, but it is a nail biter from start to finish. You're gonna have a troop of survivors that you're leading and they may die or not, depending on how good of a leader you are, but you don't necessarily win just from having the most survivors. So sacrifices sometimes may need to be made. And the solo play for this one really maintains that integrity, even though you're not bidding against other players for turn order to select the best paths, um, you are having to take into account that some paths that may be more optimal will cost more based on the row that they're placed out in, or some rows will give you resources, but you won't necessarily get to know what is happening on the path that you take. So overall, Hitsy Road is just a really great package of a game. It's one that that I always have so much fun playing with others. And even when I'm just by myself, the stories that are going through my mind as we progress through from round to round and the zombie horde becomes less and less bearable. This is one that is really exciting and just an absolute joy to play and have on the table. We are really getting down to it now with my number three pick, and this is one that may look familiar in terms of the line of games that it comes from, and that is Jordi Aiden's Cartographers, which is a role player tale, so set in the similar universe. Now, unlike role player, which is going to primarily rely on dice, this is going to be a flip and fill. So you are going to flip over cards that show different types of lands, and you will be using those along with the shapes provided to fill out a map. Map making and cartography is something that I've really been drawn to ever since I was a kid. So this was a really welcome and refreshing take on the high fantasy theme implemented in a new way. I also, like perhaps many of you, really love puzzly games that use polyaminos. And in this one, it adds a little bit more going on because in each of the different rounds, you'll be scoring two different seasons or scoring objectives that will change. So you have to not only address what the scoring conditions are for the particular season that you're in, but what will be coming up in round two, three, and four. Additionally, you'll be able to get income from surrounding mountains and there will be different monsters that will be placed onto your board and subtract points from your score if not dealt with in a timely manner. The solo play really does a great job of integrating the monsters in a way that makes sense um, in how your opponents would be playing them against you. And I just think that this is a fantastically puzzly game with a really interesting theme. Again, because it's a flip and fill, you can play it with as many players as you have pads of paper for, but I think it plays just as well solo. So that is my number three pick, Cartographers. My number two pick is a game that is very near and dear to my heart. It is a game that came out um, while I was still kind of fresh into gaming. I just thought the aesthetic of it was absolutely gorgeous. And it's one of the games that I personally feel is a great gateway game for new gamers, but provides enough challenge for seasoned gamers to keep them engaged. And that is On Earth, published by Brother White Games and designed by Jason Harner and Matthew Ransom. In this game, you are going to be playing as these different delvers, which are going in a and exploring old ruins. In addition to that, you'll be collecting different stones in order to erect different buildings and wonders. So there are multiple paths to victory in this game. There's dice rolling, which keeps it exciting, and good or bad die rolls are mitigated by the fact that high die rolls will get you closer to uncovering rooms, while lower die rolls will help you collect stones in order to build wonders. 
So there's a little bit of engine building, there's a little bit of quote unquote area control, there's die rolling, there's gorgeous illustrations and art, and there's some puzzliness to it and set collection as well. So it's a lot of little elements that come together really nicely. Now the expansion, the Lost Tribes, adds some new types of stones as well as the official solo play for the game. And this is one that, like I said, it's been in my collection for many years now, and it is still one that I like to take out and play regularly, especially now that the expansion is out. The solo play really does a great job of giving you the feel of the base game, but in a totally new way. There's an entirely separate board for the solo AI to operate, which will collect stones in order to score points. And they have their own sets of dice that will work a little bit differently than player die will in order to help them name ruins. So I think this is a game where it was clear that designing a solo element wasn't just necessarily a lazy throwaway where it's like, oh yeah, it basically just does what the other player does. There's an entire extra deck for dedicating and determining which ruins they will take. So it gives you a little bit of foresight, but there's always that draw of you never know what card will come up next. And it's clear that it takes the same mechanics, but shapes it in a way that is really amazing for solo play. So this is a great game, whether you're a solo board gamer, whether you play with friends, or even if you're looking to get more people into gaming. Unearth is just an all around wonderful package with lots of different elements, but they all work so well all together. My number one game on this list is one that may come as absolutely no surprise to some of you. And for others, it is a game that you have probably never heard of, which I have to say is such a shame, but we are here to rectify that today, so don't you worry. The original game that this second implementation is based on is one of the only games that I have given a score of a perfect 10 on Board Game Geek. In my mind, 10 is that unattainable realm of forms goal that humanity just can't reach, but that every game should strive for. This game, however, is such a solid package that to give it anything less would be shameful. This game is Capital Lux two generations designed by Elif Svensson and Christian A. Ospi, published by Aporta Game. So we're bringing it full circle. In the original Capital Lux, you are going to be drafting cards over the course of three rounds. Now, if you're like me and you don't have great memory, the drafting is just a small part of this game. The real interesting decisions come from how you play your cards after you've received them. So essentially, you are going to have a choice between playing cards to your hometown, which at the end of the round, you may be able to score for points, or playing cards to the capital, which will help all players potentially score their cards and will give you a benefit based on the suit that you play. At the end of each round, you will compare the sum of each of the suits of cards in your hometown to the sum of the cards in the capital. So for example, let's say for the yellow suit, the capital's limit or sum of cards is 10, and you have 12. Unless you have prepared adequately using other powers, you will bust if you have more than that amount and you will lose all of those points. So it's a very tense game of playing. Do I take something that is really excellent for me that makes for me a lot of points or do I help everybody else out by pushing up that limit that everybody can place and getting an added benefit for playing that card there, such as coins, which will help you increase your limit in your hometown, or modifiers, which will be secret and known only to you, drawing more cards, and just a whole wealth of things. So the original Capital Lux was playable from two to four players. In Capital Lux two generations, you're gonna be using the exact same mechanics, except if you have the expansion, you can play with up to five players now. And those four original powers for the hometowns can be swapped out with many different powers to make the game a lot more variable from play to play. And of course, in Capital Lux two generations, we have an official solo play. So in the solo version, you will be playing against an AI opponent named Rob. Rob will have cards that are face up, aka cards that you would have seen during the draft, and face down cards that will be played and placed dictated based on his AI deck. 
So this really does a great job of emulating the drafting portion where you do know some information but not everything and also of creating a situation where Rob thinks like your opponent would as to whether he wants to benefit himself or benefit potentially the both of you, but while gaining some benefits along the way. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I have to be honest, I was so worried that this game would not live up to the OG Capital Lux that after it arrived, I put off trying the solo mode for months. And I'm so upset that I did because this is literally a game that I can teach to anyone that I want to play all the time, everywhere, with every single person that I meet, like random person on the street or at the grocery store, like, hey, what's up? I have this really cool game. Do you want to play it real quick? This is just such a fantastic game. And and I don't know if this is just me, like, forcing my bias onto everybody I know and they don't want to disappoint me, but everybody that I have taught this game to, purchased it for, etc., etc., has absolutely loved it. So board game friends, if you've been lying to me, the comments section of this video is not the time to tell me. <laughs> but no, I genuinely think that everybody that I've shown this game to has really loved it. And it's such a shame that it has not had a greater spotlight shown on it because like I said, it is so simple mechanically. It plays off of drafting and card play, something that's accessible to even non-board gamers. And I mean, oh my gosh, look at this package. Like, hello. Have I mentioned that I am absolutely over the moon in love with Quan Chi Moria's art? This is just in all aspects mechanically, aesthetically, in accessibility. This is just such a fantastic game. It plays well at all player counts, and now with the solo mode, ah, oh, so fantastic. And this is definitely one that if you have not tried it, if you have not checked it out, this is one that should be like a staple in everybody's collection. So that is Capital Lux 2 Generations. So that is my top 10 list of solo flexible games. Again, if there are any games that you would suggest for this list, leave them down in the comments below for myself and everyone else watching the video to check out. I can't wait to hear from you. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please feel free to leave a like. You can also subscribe down below for more board game content. It really helps out the channel. Thank you so much again for joining me and I will see you next time. Bye. Bunnies, I swear. <laughs>